said quality good, starting live. And you see me? I do. You are live. Got some hair problems here. Definite, definite hair problems. Okay. All right, David. Thank you. Absolutely. Have fun. All right. Bye.
Ahem. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. I'm so glad to be here tonight. Very excited about our session tonight. And um, also feel free to um, comment in the chat section on YouTube, ask a question. I think we'll have some time for that. So without uh, further ado, I think I'll start. Um, hopefully you got all of the passages Xeroxed and printed out. So we can start with the first one which is from uh, uh, Kindersainen, the first uh, piece in Kindersainen. And the question um, was about the left hand, actually. And I thought it was a very interesting example because possibly a young student would be playing this or an adult who's, you know, beginning and not that advanced. So how we play the left hand is really important for the health of the person and also the success of the passage. So specifically the question was in measure one, what fingering would you take for the second uh, beat there? So it's interesting. Um, the question was about how to successfully scissor. And just to define scissor, scissor is when the hand tilts a little bit to the side and the reason that it does that is because it gives more space to the hand. The hand can reach something that ordinarily would feel stretchy, suddenly doesn't feel stretchy. So I have a kind of a wider hand, so for me, the 2-5 on that interval is not a bad fingering, actually, um, which enables me to go to the thumb on the E. Now, I find that that would be a pretty difficult interval for even an adult. So my solution would be actually not to scissor it there. 
and to do five and one and cross over with the second finger. So that's what few things about that. That's why the rotation is so important because without rotation you really have a very big shift. Remembering that all the motions working together, the rotation is going to cut down on the feeling of shifting because it's part of the whole process. So the way I would think it would be to the right and then the single note to the left. Some important things to uh, keep in mind. When we play an interval or a chord, it doesn't necessarily mean that all the fingers release exactly at the same time. So in this instance, the C sharp with the fifth finger can release a little bit sooner. Or you could put it in the opposite, you can hold on to the B flat a little bit longer. That will make it feel more secure. So if we take a look at how to um, get out of that situation, we also have to realize, okay, if we rotate it here, then how are we rotating back? Because we have to rotate back to this interval. So very often what will happen is something will go like this and kind of stop. So the bigger takeaway that I like to offer is anytime you have a situation where you have some sort of waiting, evaluate whether you're waiting on the note you just played or did that serve a purpose and send you back here. It feels much better when I'm there already. If I don't do that, then you can see at the last moment the left hand has to find its place and the right hand has to play. Separation of activity is very important to feeling calm physically and mentally actually. So we could say that the interval plays to the right rotationally, the single note to the left, and the next interval to the right. When I go from that interval to the thumb though, it's a double rotation. So there's a lot of rotational interest here. First of all, we have another factor coming from the first measure. How do we get from here to here? Well, that's interesting. When you play with the thumb, and you play an interval with the thumb again, it's a double. And why do I mention it? Because it would be very common for the thumb to kind of have the feeling of turning over, because it does so, so often. Think of, think of a, a broken octave, think of an Alberti bass, think of any kind of figure that goes to the thumb and goes back. The body is very used to the feeling of the single, you know, but if we do the single, then we're going to be off balance for the next interval. So it's important to straighten yourself up on the D and create the double. Now, one other cut at this. If for some reason you feel the technical capacity of the student is not that great. There is another option. I would say it's a less artistic and less uh, technically beautiful solution, but it is possible to do two thumbs. So that gives you a variety of ways to solve this situation. Of course, in the first measure and throughout the piece, I'm taking the third note of the triplet in the right hand. That frees us up so that we don't have to come all the way over here and get back to this interval. It's so easy just to take that as long as you voice. So if we talk about bringing it into a musical context, it's very important that the melody goes into it in the complemental note and back to the melody. That's one of the key uh, factors with having it feel kind of integrated and very sort of um, coordinated between the hands technically and musically. Because if I have no notion of how to shape, I could do something like this. And a 
immediately the music stops. So when I'm thinking, I'm really thinking this is part of an overshape. So we get consecutive overshapes in the right hand. Another way to discover that would be to find the shape of the outer voice, the upper voice. Kind of makes a little bit higher, higher. Once the arm feels that aspect, then it can actually put the other notes and feel very comfortable. Here also, this would be a more um, probable interval for a scissoring because this would be a little bit maybe more manageable, but I still think I would do with the young child 1-5 over. So I hope that gives some ideas here. I just want to mention the next to the last measure. One of the key things there that might happen is things are going along very nicely. And suddenly there's an F sharp with a thumb and it hasn't been prepared for. So the in and out there would be really helpful to a student to move in. Okay, let's move on to example number two. So this is from uh, Beethoven Sonata, Opus 27, number one. It's the sort of scherzo movement. And the question that came, or the problem that came here was managing the leaps. And I found it to be a very interesting example because with each fingering uh, selection that's possible comes some good things and some things to deal with. So, inevitably, I can't say that there's one absolute fingering here. I can tell you after I explain the various fingerings, what I think is the better fingering or what I would do. But I, would, I wanted to open it up because it's really a situation where you have to try several things, but not only fingering solves it, it's movements that solve it together with fingering. So, when you have certain fingerings, it produces certain technical challenges. And depending also on the sophistication of the technique, those challenges might be fine. But then again, the technique might not be as developed as one would like, so you might go for another type of fingering. The other thing which is somewhat important, because it's definitely a factor, is the cognitive aspect. People often say, well, isn't it easier to play a pattern fingering? And to a certain extent, yes, and in certain places, definitely, if you don't play a pattern fingering, things won't go very well. But to adhere to it like a rule creates certain problems. Here, I wouldn't say that it's a terrible, terrible problem, but it does produce a certain amount of problems. So let's go with first with the consecutive fingering, which quote-unquote, might be the easiest fingerings for somebody to learn. So, in the middle there, between the staves, I did the 1-3-5, 1-3-5, and the left hand, I would do 5-3-1. So, it seemed very simple, except we have certain challenges here, which is that, first of all, the right hand has to leap out of the way before the left hand can get here. So you're sending immediately, if you choose this fingering, you have to send the right hand ahead. And the left hand follows. Now, when we do things like sending hands ahead of other hands, realize that it's a very subtle intention. Because you would never want to do it so consciously that you do this first and then this. Because that will not segue into speed very well. It's just the notion that when I get here, the right hand is slightly ahead of the movement of the left, but my left is also continuing. So I'm not stopping my left. Okay, so this one's not so bad, but here in the right hand, I would have to go 5-5. Five, five. 
Now, if somebody has a fantastic rotational technique, they could do a little bit of an undershape, and you know they'd be they'd be fine. Um, so that's it. But you do have a leap between five and one. If we do another fingering, if we started with one, two, three, one, two, three. Then you're moving from the three to the five. So you've now made that distance a little bit more manageable because you're not going five to five, you're going three to five. In both cases, what you're asking the person to be able to do is to do a double rotation combined with another undershape. So you have to evaluate how sophisticated the technique is to be able to do those kinds of coordinations. The other thing that's really interesting is that this cannot obviously be connected to this. So this note is the first note of a leap. Whenever I see a situation where it's first note of a leap, I try to do a kind of what I call interim grouping. By interim grouping, what I mean is I take the two notes of the leap and I make that a group. So coming from here, there's a slight moment, that's all I can call it. It's not out of tempo, it's a slight moment where I then know that this is going to send me here. That produces a grouping for the leap and gets me there. If I don't have it, the only thing I can equate it to is like going to the end of the diving board and then trying to jump in without, a, without that last uh, step onto the board. So it feels like, oh my god, now I have to get there. So that feeling of not be, having enough time to get there is actually because the leap is not grouped. Once you do it a few times, you can do it without feeling that there's any, any hesitation or stopping. You just feel more secure. Now, if I do the one, two, three, one, two, three, I have some other things that I have to pay attention to in the technique. I have to make sure that my thumb is going under. So from the one to the two, my thumb is going under. From three, it goes more under. In addition to the thumb going under, the walking hand and arm is also moving across. Even before all that, I'm, at, I'm settling the question, where should my torso be? If my torso stays in the middle of the piano, there's really no comfortable way to play this. This is considerably down below middle C. So whenever I see something written below middle C, and I know that I have no other alternative other to play with my right hand, I start to think, okay, what's the adjustment of the torso? And we know that the torso can move to the left, but it also should move a little bit closer. Because if you just move to the left, it has this kind of off-balance feeling. So when it moves to the left slightly, in the combination with moving forward, I don't feel off balance. I just feel like, oh, it's so much more comfortable to get here. So you can see that the motion I made or movement I made with my body is not very big. It's really almost imperceptible, but when you're tuned in, you can see how the give in my body moved over to the left. So I start there, the thumb is coming under, and I'm also incorporating, along with the rotation, the walking hand and arm. I would say this is a very interesting passage because the in and out really gets taken care of a lot by the walking hand and arm. In other words, if I make a big out motion, I won't feel very good. If I think across, that out motion is going to happen. Of course, the third finger is what we would call the out forward. I'm coming to the third finger, it's coming out. In the moment of playing, it sends me back into the thumb. Now you notice when I have to exaggerate it or so it's show it so slowly, I really have to disconnect from here to here. But it's possible, see, with the combination, remember everything is a combination of things. 
with the combination of the rotation doing part of the job, the walking hand and arm doing another part of the job, the thumb doing another part of the job by releasing under, then the shaping does the rest of the job and makes me feel like I can get to my thumb very smoothly. So that's another option. The other option is to take a different approach, meaning making a decision maybe that this is just this is just something not for you. Five five, three three five, not for you. You want one five. It's doable. That means you have to start on the second finger. Two, three, one, two, three, one, five. So the, it's written very, very much to the, at the top of that thing. Uh, like I said, this handout is not a thing of beauty, but I hope that we can make it just useful. So starting with two, three, you're starting, important point here, is starting not with the thumb out over there. The thumb is already underneath the hand. I'll reiterate that when you turn your hand over and let your thumb fall in, there's no squeezing involved in that thumb position. We have all of this space that the thumb can move in before we feel that this is squeezing. If we go behind four, that's going to squeeze it. Now, I can so I can start with, not with the thumb out over there, but underneath, and I'm right here. And then I have no, no leap here to, to worry about. It's a pretty good fingering. The left hand also, instead of doing the 5-3-1-5-3-1-5-3-1, it can also do the bottom fingering. 5-4-2-1-4-2-1-3-1. So in a way, we're taking away some of those sort of terrifying leaps, which was the question, how do I make the leap better? Um, now, what's also very interesting about this is that the left hand has to have certain skills also. I find this to be very, very common. I don't know if the teachers listening tonight find it common also. But somewhere the body initially wants to do something like this on an arpeggiated figure. I, try, I find it hard to do, but I'm going to do it. How, okay, how do people do this? That's what they do. Okay, yeah. So the, the, the note after the thumb becomes the place where they're going down. So they're doing... And then they find the rest of it really difficult to do. So remember that the shaping here is a four note shape. So we always number it to help us understand where the high point is. So the high point in this case is between the fourth finger and the second finger. My second finger, after it's gone higher to four, goes a little bit more and begins to come down to two and down to level on the thumb, and that begins to come up again. So it's consecutive, one, two, three, four. We always count the last note as the first note of the shape, one, two, three, four, one, three. Oh, one, three, that one, two, three at the end. Right there, we have a two note undershape. Three note overshape, two note undershape, three note overshape, two note undershape, three note overshape. So from there, it's very consistent what happens. So it's possible not to feel any of those leaps. You could still, if you were very um, um, much wanting the articulation, you can still articulate. Within all that coordination, you just let go a, a little bit. Um, some things I wanted to say about crossing over. Some really um, common things in the whole crossing over. Very often people just don't come down to the second finger. It seems to be a fairly common thing. And the minute they feel that, then the thumb feels correct. But then on the flip side of it, they come down and they come down too far to the thumb. So one of the uh, ways that you can maybe kind of help yourself, self-coach yourself, is take the chord as is 
and determine, okay, that's where I am. Within that, if I shake, how high and low am I really needing to go? That tiny down is enough to get me over. So the down shouldn't feel ever, I always say, it shouldn't feel like walking and suddenly your foot goes into some kind of hole or something. It shouldn't feel like you lost the bottom. So, but if it doesn't settle down in the arm, then the crossover won't be very good because there's no basis for the arm to move over. Another common thing is that the double rotation from two to one somehow gets erased. And what happens then is that there'll be twisting because if there's no rotation, there's twisting. So you see that fairly often, you know, people twisting to the thumb side. So, even though it doesn't look like I'm coming from way over here, the thumb is activated in a way that I'm not positioned exactly over that note, and I have the sense of the finger moving together with the hand and the forearm, of course, but it's very small. So, I hope that that has some helpful things for arpeggios, for leaps, uh, if you do the other fingering, for moving one hand a little bit ahead of the other if you need to, for some shaping issues. Um, so I think that's quite a lot there. Let's go to number three. So number three is interesting um, because years ago Taubin had a certain fingering for that and uh, what, it, what, what it ended up being with Taubin was uh, the left hand only had one note in all the occurrences of this. This is the Chopin Polonaise, uh, A flat Polonaise um, and it's really the introduction and it's the second to the last time this figure occurs. So it was very interesting, and I, I never found that, that it fully solved it. And when I, when I got this example, I had had something, I, I taught this last, last year or two years ago, and I had come up with something that was different than what Taubman had. So I, um, I, I thought it was really good, but I also wanted a, like, you know, a second opinion. So I actually ran it by Edna, and she she actually felt it was actually a, a better solution. So I wanted to share it with you because um, it's, it's, um, it feels really good when you have that fingering, but there are some things that we have to do technically to make it feel really good. So I know that, that there's a lot of clutter on, on this passage, but I'll walk you through it. So let's go to the left hand. So the left hand, instead of starting um, what had been previously thought there, 5-3, I'm starting with 2 and 4. And I'm moving to 1 and 3. And then I go into single notes. So I'm using 2, 1, 3, 2. So that's the whole left hand there. Once I do the 4-2, I can put my thumb on the upper part, on that D natural. And then the next I have the three in the one in the bass and the two in the right hand. Here's where I, the change is really helpful. I took the next interval in the right hand. So the two notes, the E natural and the B natural, are up in the uh, right hand. And the left hand has the second finger. And then one four in the upper part, two five, one four. And 2-5 is not on the page, but 2-5. Okay, so fingering-wise, that's the fingering that, that I thought was good. But what's very interesting here is that we have a grouping that really helps make it feel like it's possible to play in speed. And the grouping, the grouping breaks after the second 16th note of the last beat. So what I'm saying is... This part is in one group, and then that's the other group. So, oh, sorry. Okay. So 
why do we need that grouping? The one thing about this is that the thumb that has just played the first note has to now move down to the B natural. When we do that, the position of these two intervals are very close together. So in order to reposition the hand for the next thing, the grouping is needed. If I don't, I'm in this position, and then that makes the last two things very hard to get to. So what I wanted to share here is how important looking at the music and seeing where are the biggest shifts needed, and does that possibly mean that I need a grouping, so that in the moment of the grouping, my arm can get to a different place. So if I do this, there's a slight let go in the right hand, because I can completely, completely connect it. But when I connect it, my arm is kind of blocked in a certain way, where I find it hard to get to the last two. But if I break here, now I don't need to break in the left hand, I just was showing you that. This breaks, and that makes the passage, I think, much more manageable. So in this example, it's really about the redistribution, the fingering, and grouping. There's a tiny shape there, but I wouldn't say that it's a big deal. It feels a little bit like uh, one shape to, to the C and the F, and another shape to the next downbeat, if that communicates. Okay. We'll do maybe one more, and then maybe if there are questions about any of these four, you can certainly write it in the chat window, and we can see if uh, we can answer some. Okay, so the next example is from the Winter Wind Etude, and the, the uh, question was about coming down, coming down in the pattern after the, the middle of the bar. Uh, pianists felt that uh, they kept missing, particularly that F, right where, um, right where the G flat goes to the F. So we want to take a look at that. So we we know that that very often one of the the, the most um, profound uh, corrections that we feel is when suddenly we have been twisting and we don't twist anymore. So that, for me, was also a very big moment when Taubman showed me just how to move in somewhere and suddenly I didn't twist and it really felt so much easier. So we do kind of say very often that, you know, you have to move into the thumb. So one might think in this example that the F should stay inside because very quickly afterward I'm going to that G flat. In theory, I would say that works an enormous amount of the time. In this passage, it doesn't work for some reason. This is a passage where after the break, it has to come out. So I actually, coming out of the, um, out of the black key area, in order to, to play the rest of the figure, very different than thinking, stay inside so I don't have much in and out. Now, let's see why we have to do it here. I think the whole reason is because this is a half step. If this were a more a, a whole step, we could, we could manage it. But we can't manage it, I think, mostly because of the half step. There's something about that half step that makes it very difficult to get the five inside. So, how do we begin to practice this and manage it? There are several things to consider here. First of all, whenever I think about a one to five in this context, I already know it's non-connectable. So, how we disconnect can mean the difference between the success and ease of the passage and just like doing it academically, like, okay, 
it has to be disconnected. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I'm taking advantage of the disconnection in several ways. I'm not just disconnecting. If I disconnect, this is what I get. I don't know if it shows up on the camera, but my forearm is way too much over to the right for the notes that come after it because I have to get my arm all the way down there. So, when I disconnect, I'm shifting my forearm closer to be in a better proximity to all of those notes. So, it's the difference, maybe simpler said, the difference between just going to the F or using the disconnection to relocate the arm in a position that makes several notes after it very good. I have to caution you, because if you do it and you go full tilt, then you'll twist. So you can't go to every single note. You're going to an area, is the best way that I can describe it. It's more left than you would think, but not completely left where it's in like chord position for that. So, a few other things about this guy. When you, when you come to the th thumb, very often people, once again, will go up, and that's the wrong shape. So the shaping here comes down to the G flat, and the G flat actually begins the shape. So this is where you get that whole area of shaping doesn't begin and end in the same places that groupings do. Grouping-wise, that finishes the start. Shaping-wise, this starts the shape to the F. So the shape is one, two, three, four notes, followed by one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So that also helps you put the high points in the right place. So we have, obviously the rotation is not complicated here, it's a single rotation. The in and out comes a little bit further out than you would think it should come out. The walking hand and arm is also adjusting each time I go. And the torso is adjusting. This question comes off, uh, up a lot. Well, don't I have to play the left hand too? Yes, obviously you do. However, when you're practicing the right hand, the torso should respond according to what you're playing in the right hand. If you're practicing the left hand, it should re respond to the left hand. And then it has to find out where do I ne really need to be. So there's a sense of being not completely over here, which I wasn't even really over there when I played it separately, but there's a compromise. I'm somewhere in between those two things. And as I come here, as the walking hand and arm is coming, you notice I have to move my torso, otherwise I can't get the playing mechanism in. Okay. Um, a few other tiny little things that I actually find help a lot. Because we're always considering, okay, what does the forearm do? Okay, it rotates, it goes in and out, it moves across in the walking hand and arm, it goes up and down. We can get what I would call very army, <laughs> where the other parts of the mechanism mm, are kind of dragged around by the arm. So in this passage, what's really interesting, as I go back to that F, if I enliven my hand and the finger, it, it, it makes it so much easier. If I'm just thinking the forearm could be a proportion issue, I'm not exactly sure. I think it all comes down to a proportion issue. But it's a sensation issue too. The sensation of moving of moving the five with the hand. Now, I'm not saying just the finger and the hand, the arm is there. But because you've maybe worked a lot on what the arm's supposed to be doing, 
the hand and the finger can become a little bit less active and therefore it feels kind of heavy. So if we you want to check that, that's a really good um, thing to, to look at here. Um, I think one of the other f factors in just in terms of putting it hands together is once again that whole notion that I mean from childhood most of us were taught that you see certain note values and you have to hold those note values full length but you can see the kinds of problems we would have suddenly moving at the very last moment so you are there's a pedal marking right there why not play the A flat and move here already so that the left hand continues to move a little bit ahead of when it's supposed to play. So it's... Oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to say something. Yes. The feeling of what it's like to play vertically is important here. This really needs to know it goes together so that we really feel vertically what's happening because the line is moving so horizontally. So consider a few of those, those things. I don't see any, I see people talking to each other, but no questions, no problem. So I will just keep going. Okay, number five. This is from a Schubert song and a difficult one, and uh, spent a lot of time on this because it wasn't completely clear to me, different aspects, well, I will say it this way, different aspects became clear to me at different moments. <laughs> so um, I found it to be rather complicated and rather complex. So I wanted to, to go into some detail here in terms of uh, arriving at a feel that feels really easy to play but is actually quite complicated in terms of the practicing of it and the layering of the different elements. So first thing, the register. I would highly recommend, you know, taking that last A of the first measure in the left hand so that you can begin with two, five, two, five, two, one. Now, this is a, a passage that I probably would be a little bit scissored because I, don't, I have a wide hand but I don't feel good straight on. So a little bit on the side. It's a very interesting thing. With rotation, even though you scissor, you don't feel off balance. I don't know quite how to uh, put that into words, but I don't feel like I have bad balance on the keys. I feel like the, the, the keys feel solid. So it's possible to scissor. When you're rotating, there's a moment where it just feels straight down, even though it's a single. So it settles the hand. The fingering that I came up with was 2, 5, 2, 1, 5, 1. Now, the reason that I came up with that, and I wanted to give some insight into what, I, what else I tried, because one can say, okay, well, you know, you tell us never to stretch, you tell us blah, 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 the 2-5 seems a little bit wide. Why can't it just be 1-5-1, one, one, yeah, 1-5-1-1-5-1? One, 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 one. Okay, so I have to say this. I'm a huge fan of Thumb Thumb. It can get us out of so many scrapes. But it's not the fastest fingering in the world. If that Thumb Thumb really stops a tremendous amount of crossing over or something, then I'd say, yes, definitely do it. But here, it's not, it's not really uh, stopping a crossing over because I can do two, five, two, one, and there's no crossover. So we have to go into how do we solve this, given that that is really the best fingering. You can just try it. If you try one, five, one, one, five, and you try to go fast, I think it's pretty obvious that that's not going to work. So you have to kind of back the truck out and you have to go a different course. So immediately I went to, 
Actually, I went to this fingering first, but I thought I owed it to myself to try the thumb-thumb. So I, I did. I tried it, and I, I, I did away with it. So the 252151. So then I thought to myself, well, what is the in and out organization of this? Because it's very complicated. And it actually is. So the, the, the five is an out forward, and the two is an in in. Which begins to point me in the direction of the shape. When I, when I do this two note under, Uh, sorry, it's tiny, very, very tiny. Then suddenly something feels smoother. So from the second triplet into the third triplet is really where the thing is very detailed. I have to come out to the two and I have to make an undershape. Without that undershape, the situation doesn't feel very good. So, here's the beginning of your undershape, from the thumb to the two to the five. Back over, another one, under. Now, I left the, the, the shaping markings on the second part of the measure because that's what I thought it was initially. I thought it was coming down to here and just consecutive over shapes but I felt very stuck. It didn't go with the in and out that I worked out. So, you can change the second part to that three note undershape. Once you get the combination of motion there, you really feel you can, you can go into speed. One other thing that I wanted to show here, which I thought was important, was where it changes. So there are a few places where it changes because actually the fingering changes. And they correlate with where I cross over the thumb. So if I go to the second line, As I'm going to the second beat, I'm no longer going to be able to do the fingering I did on the first beat. So here the fingering goes one five one two five two one. And if you realize that that just creates one over shape, then you have the speed there. But you have to be conscious that the feel changes. Remember that everything that we're doing has to go into a feel into an automatic sense of something where you're not thinking the particular things, it just feels good because it's working a certain way. But you have the, the tools and the power to make it really feel good and to transition into speed without feeling like it doesn't, uh, like you have to force it faster. So I thought that this was a very interesting example really for the complexity. And it's always so surprising to me because some of the simplest sound in music, you know, kind of the, the kind of um, transparent, kind of simple kinds of things, some Schubert, Mozart, and all that, can sometimes be so highly complicated technically, that, and fine things, like very, very small gradations of things. So I wanted to leave you with, this is a very good example of really establishing a good fingering first, and then a fingering that will work in speed. Understanding how the in and out works, um, how shaping works in relationship to the in and out, and the grouping. This grouping uh, is really helpful too to do six notes. New group. And the reason why that grouping works so well is it minimizes the experience of the in and out. And I want to say that very carefully. It doesn't take away the in and out. It minimizes the experience of the in and out. If I were to group it in threes, I feel like I'm really working to go in and out. When I group it in six, the grouping feels, the, the passage feels very easy. I don't feel busy. Um, 
feeling busy, by the way, when things feel very sort of hectic and busy, can be a symptom of a lack of a grouping or a grouping that has too few notes in it. So think about those things in passages that you might be playing. Experiment. Say, oh, that, I think that that looks obvious grouped in three. But what happens if I group it in six? Will it feel actually better? And sometimes, immediately, you'll feel that difference. So, a good example of, like I said, the fingering, the in and out, the shaping, and grouping. All converging and having to work side by side. Let's go to uh, example six. In example six, this is from the Chopin B flat minor sonata. And the question was, what, what's the fingering, the shaping, and the grouping of the left hand? And I thought it was very interesting also because if you look at it, you look at the bottom part, it so clearly looks like it's in threes. And then you, you see also that the last note of the three is played with a thumb. So it would be really easy to think that it's just a three note overshape. But in doing a three note overshape, it is a lot of effort to get to the F sharp. So let's talk about the shaping first and then we'll talk about the fingering. So shaping wise, the shaping ends on the F sharp. And then it's a three note under. And then this is the beginning of another over, which goes to the G sharp. And under, the beginning of the next over, to the B, two note under. Okay, that's what's going on in shaping world. And you can see when I only show shaping, do you see how big those shapes are? If I only show you shaping, that's the main vehicle for getting around the passage. It's going to be an exaggerated element. So what else is going on here? Obviously, I think the most important thing is the double rotation to the thumb. If you go from the third finger and pull the thumb over, that's where things are going to go wrong. So the feeling is very lateral. If I go too high in the shape, I can't get over laterally, which is interesting. The very thing that one doesn't want to do um, is pull over. So you can see that the double rotation is crucial. But if I only have double rotation alone, that rotation is going to be very big. So the walking hand and arm comes into play and another element comes into play. In order not to make a huge shape, I am slightly letting go of the third finger. Now, the question that we had was, um, is it confusing to do five, three, one, one, three, five produces quite a big stretch on the bottom. So I think it's necessary to go to the second finger. Now, if the person doesn't feel confused, then I just leave it alone. But if the person feels confused, I also see a po another possibility. of play Because the, the two can be more inside, actually, I find it an easier fingering. So I'm still doing the same shaping, same double, but I'm letting go a little bit, and that makes the shape very flat. It doesn't feel very rounded here. So flat, and I find that the two works great. And also it's nice to go back to the two. Let me talk about this moment, end of the first measure. Most common thing is to go to the left here because we do it so often. But really, that's a moment where it's a double. It has to play from the right to the left, but stop straight down, exit to the right, play to the left. Those are places where the double rotation is crucial because the moment it goes like this, the whole rest of the passage is not going to feel good. I also found that that alone wouldn't solve it. So what else is really interesting here, which probably doesn't happen in the first measure, but definitely in the second measure, is grouping. 
coming to here, finishing the group, I really have need a strong start. This has to really start, start. Without that, there's a certain confusion. It's a grouping by direction, actually. And when we do that direction, we only need the one direction. It only feels like it's coming up. Obviously, the music goes back down, but I don't feel it. If you want to know specifically, this is what I would call an undershape, slight undershape here. So that pertains to the left hand. In the right hand, I found it very interesting also, because hand size becomes a factor here. If you have a, a normal sized hand, maybe even, or slightly on the smaller side, I recommend actually going to the 1 4. Now, what's interesting about that is it is less stretchy. The other possibility is the 2 5. If my hand is a little bit wider, the 2 5 keeps me kind of outside here. Where the 1-4, I have a bigger movement to get out. So if I do the 1-4 on the C-sharp A, then I have to move further out. But that's one of the things one has to deal with. Um, with the 2-5, this is a little bit closer. So keep that in mind. Um, with the 1-4, the most important thing is the sending. We see the last notes of things and we kind of release and stay there. Move it over to here. Move it over to here. So you can see I'm constantly trying to go where I'm going to play. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I um, wanted to talk about that too. But I want to say one other thing. When we, we do all of that letting go, also let go inside of a shape. This is all coming down over shape to the F sharp and the D. Then that starts the next one, which goes to the down B. And then to the G sharp E. So that helps the shaping of the, the right hand, basically. Um, when we get to the end, it's very helpful to feel, at the very last moment here, the 5 is getting replaced by the 3. And at the same time that it's getting replaced, it's coming out. Because if you stay inside, you'll get stuck. So I would say after after the C sharp, the next interval is coming out, which sets us up for an interesting thing too, because the octave with the coming out, I have to play forward to the octave. It's not a big motion, but it's a balance. It's very very common for us to go from a black note like this to a white key and we play on on the out motion and uh, that's sometimes confusing for people but there's time always remember we have all kinds of micro time I can play this come out uh, and I have time to play forward So even though this is coming out, that doesn't mean I have to continue out to the white key, if that makes any sense. Okay. I got a, a message from someone. The two helps a lot. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I have another message, so I wanted to, to make sure people got a question answered, so we'll spend the last five minutes with this question. In the Beethoven, I have trouble getting to the E-flat octave in measure 13. Ah, okay. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Oh, I see why. Okay, so there are different possibilities here. Once again... 
it's a lot about fingering, a lot about the rotation, the walking hand and arm. So let's take a look at it. So we're back in the second example, the Beethoven. At the end of the first line, this is the, I hope this is the right place. Um, so what it's this one. Okay, good. So one thing to realize is if I'm in, in this, five, two, one, four, two, one. My thumb is still quite in another position for this octave. The octave is not, doesn't feel that close, so I think that's why the person's having problems. So why don't we take the E flat, the C, and the G, and move the walking hand and arm across. So if I keep my arm over here, then I have one moment in which I have to move, it's going to feel very sudden. Now the other thing, that could affect the feeling of the E flat, how we rotate away from it, which brings up this, um, brings up the concept of when we have an interval followed by a single note, which way do we rotate? Well, if that single note is located between the two notes of the interval, then we rotate from the thumb side. So I think that's a factor, because if I ro rotate from the five side, it will feel very big. So it's left, right, left, left. That's how the rotation works here. Left, right, left, left. Now, I have to say one other thing about that, that it's a process. I would practice the feeling of this, but in the end, I'm thinking five to two. It's one of those strange things that the theory doesn't equate to the feeling. I don't really feel in the end that I'm going from the thumb, but I don't feel this extra motion if I had come from the five side. So it smooths it out. So you can try that. One more question, and I think then we'll have to set. Question number four example. Where on the key C is the second finger playing after the out on five F? Where is the C after? Question. Where on the key C is the second finger? I have one in four. Okay, I, I'm not quite sure what that refers to. Um, if there's a way to clarify the question, I'm not sure. I can answer where on the, the where on the keyboard I am on the C. I'm out. I'm out pretty far. Because I don't want to be in for this interval. If you're asking about the C in the left hand, it's kind of in the middle of the key. Oh, <laughs> that's why. I was on the wrong example. Number four. Okay. Number four. Where on the key is the second finger playing after the out of... Oh, okay, I understand. I understand. This one. This guy. Okay. This is a great question, because if I think to go in... If I think to go in, it's going to be too far in. It is a little bit in. Tiny bit in. What's more important is to get that walking hand and arm. Once you get that, it's going to place the second finger actually right where it is. So if you ask me specifically, I'm slightly inside the black key area. I'm not in there. I'm slightly in and it seems, seems to work. In the act of playing, I think it goes, I think it goes further in, but not too much. The minute I try to get too far in, it, it, it disturbs it. Okay, so I will schedule another session, most probably next Thursday. Um, so we got to six of the, the ten. So there are a few people who put some in the queue on the waiting list, so I will continue with those, so I won't ask for additional ones. 
we'll do the rest of these and then I will uh, see if we do another session we'll have new new examples so I should talk to the camera thank you guys so much I want to tell you that I really miss all of you so much being live uh, it's wonderful on the internet but it's not the same as seeing you and and feeling your responses to things uh, feeling your questions to me uh, that kind of interaction and I hope we we get back to to something that we knew before as soon as possible but I want everyone and hope everyone is safe I think about you and uh, hope that we will see each other soon take care guys